Good day, everyone, and welcome to episode 51 of the Sachin Adam Show. So I'm not going to give too much of a lengthy introduction because that's what Adam's for. But today we have a partner from Deloitte Monitor, Peter Corbett, on the show. Yeah, so very impressive guest today, which I met about a month ago. And he really impressed me through his career, but also the sort of balance he has in his life um, and all his sort of accomplishments. But basically, Peter is a partner at Deloitte, a firm that a lot of people would have heard of. Um, and he's head of Monitor Deloitte in Sydney. So they really focus on strategy consulting. And we're going to dive into what that is a bit later. Um, but Peter is also a former entrepreneur. He started a number of different businesses and he studied com arts at Sydney. So thank you very much for coming on, Peter. Thanks for having me, guys. And after um, Adam and Peter met, Adam actually called me and he was like, dude, I've had one of the best conversations in my life. <laughs> so we have, we have a lot of stuff to, um, there's a lot of kind of pent up um, apprehension for this episode. So Peter, um, we like to start off our podcast by just asking our guests if they have any anecdotes or kind of stories that show the person they are today. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, the best conversation of your life. Hopefully that turns into the best podcast of your life. <laughs> I can't promise that either. Um, uh, look, I, I think there's probably not one story that really shapes uh, who I am. But, you know, one of my core mantras, I think, is, um, you know, you've got to work hard, but also be nice to people. Um, and I think it's the balance of those two things that, that really shapes um, the way that I, I view life. Um, that's probably a little bit... Um, shaped by uh, my, my grandparents even. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to have been able to meet, um, have all four of my grandparents well into uh, you know, their eighties and you know, I was in, in my twenties. So um, I was able to share a lot of their stories and their life lessons. Um, uh, my, my, grand, my granddad on my mum's side was a World War II veteran. Um, he flew, flew bombers over uh, you know, the Black Forest. He was shot down, he spent you know, a year in a Nazi uh, prison camp. And, you know, on, on discussions with him, you know, he was always very complimentary of his captors. Um, they all looked after him very well. Um, and when he came back to Australia, he had four daughters um, and he worked four jobs to put them through uh, private schools here in Sydney. Um, so, you know, you know, a huge... Uh, resilience and work ethic that, um, you know, I've always admired. Uh, and certainly that's shown through my parents as well. Um, you know, equally my parents, they're, they're, they're doctors um, and, you know, probably probably more on the academic side of, of, of medicine nowadays. But, um, you know, as, a, uh, as someone growing up, um, you know, having someone who works very hard, but then also studies um, at the same time, you know, just instilled in me a work ethic that's, uh, you know, I try to bring to, to what I do in my life. And my wife is now a doctor herself. So I, I get to see that firsthand, um, you know, working pretty, pretty, pretty long hours, but also coming home and studying. And, you know, I, I guess I apply that in my, in my day job. I think the, I think the other major experience, um, and this is a little bit to the point around be good to people, um, you know, when I, when I left school, uh, I, you know, went to university and I will never forget one of the first days at Deloitte, actually, um, got a call um, from uh, uh, the, the recruiter who was there. We were, you know, I was with my grad class. We were all getting our new computers and laptops. And uh, this, this recruiter um, at, at Deloitte pulled me aside and said, look, I've had a call from your dad. Um, now, you know, one of your friends has actually killed himself. Uh, and I was like, absolutely blown away because um, I, I didn't see it coming. And this guy was, you know, a uh, really good friend of mine. Uh, he went to high school with me. Um, he was probably the happiest guy. He was, he was, a, he was the ducks of the school. Um, and, you know, in the, in the lead up to that, I, I had no idea how he was feeling. So, um, you know, that absolutely floored me as, a, as someone in my 20s. Um, and, you know, obviously friends all around my friend group, but it also made me realize that actually there's a lot going on in people's lives that are behind the scenes. So you always have to have a bit of grace and um, uh, approach things with, with a mentality that, you know, you, you may not have all the information um, that sits behind it. So yeah, be good to people when you can. Um, so that's probably the other major story that's um, you know, really shaped, I guess, what I, what I am today. And, you know, there's, there are others, no, no doubt that I'm missing, but, um, you know, I just think of those things um, as being what shapes about my, my ethic about uh, working hard and being good to people. 
Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important lesson. I think a lot of the people we see in the corporate world, we think they're just sort of like robots. They work really hard. They have these goals and go after them. But then people often forget that everyone is just a human being with their own sort of trials and tribulations. Yeah. Um, I've actually experienced that firsthand where like kind of interns and younger people see partners as almost like aliens and like they don't want to approach them. And it's just like, it, like I think people often forget that everyone's a human. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think that's changing though. I, I, I definitely think um, the corporate world in many respects is more flat than it was in, in previous versions. And, and certainly um, with the rise of, you know, some of the startups and startup culture, um, you know, it, it is quite flat. Or it can be quite flat. So, um, you know, certainly I, I try to bring that into my work ethic. I'm, my door is always open if you want to have a conversation. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's it's a really important part of not only um, an effective work environment, but you know, also uh, you know, helping people to reach their potential. Um, I, I think if you if you maintain that sort of structure of um, it being quite hierarchical, it can get in the way of um, you know actually some nuggets uh, or you know in problem solving, which is what I do, um, or from people actually feeling like they really want to be working where they are. So. Yeah, very, very important. So Peter, over email um, and while having coffee, you've mentioned to me that business strategy is now more important than ever, especially during COVID. And so for our listeners, would you be able to dive into what strategy actually means? And secondly, how do you think about strategy in terms of strategy at Deloitte, but also strategy in your own life? Yeah, um, wow, there's there's a big loaded questions for for a strategy partner. So Look, I'll tackle the first one, which is probably, you know, what is strategy? And <clears throat> certainly it's, it can be seen and has been seen as, as a bit of a buzzword in business. So um, certainly, you know, and alongside with things like innovation and transformation, um, it's probably the original business buzzword, if I, if I would say so. But if it's done well, it's, it's actually extremely important to a business. Uh, and I, and I, of course, I'm going to say that because I'm biased, but um, having seen strategies enacted, I, I'm very good at picking out what are good strategies and what are not so good strategies. Um, you know, to, to simply define it, and, and this is not necessarily my definition, this is actually a definition that we use at Monitor Deloitte from a, a practice that we, we look at of strategy, which is based on a framework called the cascade of choices. Um, that cascade of choices basically describes strategy as an act of making choices. There are these sort of five different choices that you need to make um, in order to position your organization to win. Um, and you know that will play out over a certain period of time. But there's a couple of really important things in that. So one is strategy is about choice. Um, it's what you will do and what you won't do. Um, so strategy really specifies the choice to do something versus not others. And what second to that is that actually there are, there are lots of different choices when they are tied together, um, create a, a narrative um, or, or a set of um, directions that a company can take. Um, and the third thing I would say is it's about um, the position. So you need to take a position on a particular choice. Will you play in that area or will you not? Um, and finally, um, and I think this is probably the most interesting one, is um, strategies about winning. Um, so people don't entertain choices that just kick the can down the road. Well, they shouldn't, um, because then why are you doing that? Um, the, 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 the framework that we use actually posits that all the choices that you have in your organization should add up to a winning position. So something that um, makes it compelling um, something that will beat your competitors in in the area in which you play. Um, so with that sort of a frame, that's how I think about strategy. Um, why is it really important right now? Um, well, I think with COVID-19 in the last, um, you know, 12 months, uh, and certainly its intensity last year, uh, I, w- I would challenge anyone, any organization really, um, to look at the choices that they're making currently or are likely to make and see whether the assumptions that they have around those choices still hold. Because the the reality is that a lot of them don't. Um, and you know, I'll give you an example, whether it's, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a funny one, but you know, if you're a toilet paper manufacturer in Australia, 
um, your, your choice around how to serve customers has probably changed. There was a huge spike in demand um, for toilet paper earlier on, but you know, have you actually changed the way in which you will um, show up in the longer term um, given that there's been a huge spike in demand, probably people have a lot of toilet paper at home. Um, how do you get people to buy toilet paper in the longer term? Um, similarly, so for on the other side of things, if you're a travel company or, or maybe a gym where you saw a drop in demand in your physical location, um, a lot of those organizations have had to rethink, well, what kind of organization are we really? Um, you know, we've seen interesting choices like, uh, you know, gyms going to online uh, and providing online classes um, to support people's memberships, um, which was them sort of looking at, well, what are the other ways in which we can have our members interact with us? And we've seen travel companies, you know, like Qantas, uh, selling off their wines, uh, uh, selling off old old equipment, um, you know, uh, putting their planes into a desert. Um, those, those kinds of choices are actually all driven by the assumptions that they have around the future and, and, and what's, to, what's to happen. So, you know, I'm just giving you some simple examples of why strategy is probably more important now than it ever has been. Um, but the ability for companies to rationalize why, why they're making the choices that they are off the back of a changed set of assumptions, which I think for every company that's happened um, is a big part of that. Um, just to the just to the point on on strategy. So as I said, we we sort of look at this strategy cascade, um, which is a, a set of choices. Um, and I'll just frame that a little bit. It, if you if your listeners want to read a really good book on strategy, and certainly one that I, I attest to, um, it's one called Play to Win, um, and it's written by two people. So one uh, Roger Martin, who was one of the MDs of Monitor. Um, Monitor was a consulting firm that was started by Michael Porter. Um, Michael Porter, Porter's Five Forces, if you, if you have read that um, or, or understand that framework, um, he set up this, this, this consulting organization, which Deloitte bought in 2012. Um, A.J. Laffey is the other author of that book. A.J. Laffey was, A.G. Laffey, sorry, um, was the um, author of, uh, sorry, A.G. Laffey was the CEO of Procter & Gamble. Uh, and so that book really goes on how, goes through how the application of that framework relates to um, Procter & Gamble and the choices that they make in that company. The other thing I would say, which is also related to strategy is that um, there's a perception, and certainly I think people would feel this, that strategy is done in an ivory tower um, and it's done by the senior executives. And I actually think that one of the biggest things that I work with clients on is turning strategy from being this thing that's done by the strategy team or the, the executive team into something that's democratized that everyone can talk about and have a, have a dialogue in that supports better choice making. Um, because um, if it's just done in an ivory tower, um, this sort of concept of strategy versus execution um, starts, to, starts to form. What, what I would argue is that strategy without execution is not strategy at all. So your ability to, to, to link those two together is, is very much based on your ability to democratize the, the way in which strategy is discussed, described, challenged um, throughout an organization. So um, that's certainly an, another major component to, to how to think about it. Um, I think the final part of your question was, um, how do I apply it in my life? Well, the cascade has these five choices. Um, Firstly, what is, what is your ambition or what's your aspiration? Um, so what do, you, what do you want to do? And that aspiration has to be a winning one. So what, what would, how would you define winning uh, as a company? And you know, what I would say in my career is that I've seen winning be very specific or the way that people describe their aspirations, very financially profit-driven. Um, I would say it's tending way more towards purpose-driven um, strategy. So what is the purpose of which we have? What would it take for us to win with a purpose? Uh, and that's certainly something in the last 12 months that has been a big change. Um, the second choice is where to play. So if you have this aspiration, this purpose that you want to have um, uh, obtain, your where to play choices for which customers, which channels, which markets, which, uh, which products might I, might I um, use uh, in order to achieve that aspiration. Your third choice is around how to win. So um, what is your, your unique service proposition? What's your, what's your value proposition? And there's two classic ways to win. One is you know, be, be lowest cost and the other one is to be differentiated. So 
in every place that you play, you know, how do you, how do you win? Um, what is the, what is the unique value proposition that you bring to bear? Um, the fourth choice is around capabilities. So, you know, what are the things, the, the, the strengths, the, the activities, the, um, the processes that you have in place in order to make your how to win true in the places in which you play? And then finally, there's management systems. So how do you measure that? How do you bring those things to life? So across those five choices, um, that's how we work with companies to, to define what are, what are good choices. And it's an integrated set of choices. So, you know, if you go down the cascade, um, you can tell a co coherent story around why you're doing things. If you go up, you can tell a coherent story. So how does it re um, map to my ambition? So for me personally, I think, um, yeah, you can think about well, what are your ambitions? Um, you know, where do you play in life? So, you know, what, what are the kinds of problems you want to solve? What are the kinds of people you want to work with? And then how to win. So how do you personally show up? Um, you know, what skills do you have? What, what um, experiences do you need to, to need, do you need to form um, in order to be the best at doing that thing? Um, and the capabilities. So, you know, courses, skills, people that you meet uh, and the management system. So what are the systems that you put in place to check that you are on path, that you're on track, that you are, um, you know, achieving what you want to achieve. So actually you can apply that strategy framework to your own life um, very simply um, and create the kind of narrative that you see yourself playing out over the next two to three years. Well, that's an extremely comprehensive guide to strategy. Yeah. I think everyone listening is gonna... Sorry, I feel like I was rambling on a bit there, but... <laughs> I feel like I want to sort of download that word for word, put it in a book and then the dumbest yeah. strategy. <laughs> that was good. Well, we can switch it up. Um, Peter, I have a question surrounding kind of the post-evaluation of a strategy, right? So you have yeah. these principles of a strategy. After the fact, how do you evaluate what makes a good strategy? I know it would be very kind of problem specific, but I'm sure there's some elements that after the fact, you can kind of point to some general elements of, of a good strategy. And maybe even if you can, I'm not sure if you can, is um, if there's any examples of good strategies you've seen play out across your career. Yeah, okay. Uh, wow. Two, two more good questions. Um, so firstly, uh, the post evaluation, I, let me go pre first. So what is a good strategy? Um, in my view, a good strategy is one that is actually creating choices that, that, that are real um, and that allow you to win. So kind of what I've just talked about. There are some little tricks that you can play there. So one is um, if you look at a choice, um, you know, a good choice is one where the inverse of that choice or the inverse of that statement um, could be true. And the, the classic example is, and you see this a lot, you know, companies put forward, you know, we want to be a customer centric organization, <clears throat> which the flip of that would be, you're not a customer centric organization. So can you, can you find me a strategy in which some the customer is not important to, to a company? Like, can you find me that company? Because I don't think they will exist really. Um, so, you know, that's not a great choice um, to, to make. Um, you know, there are certainly choices when you're saying customer centricity is important. So if you're, if you're formed up around product lines and you want to move to more customer centric lines, yeah, that is a legitimate choice. But if you're just saying, you know, let's be customer centric, it's very high level, doesn't really mean anything. So the more specific you can be around, um, what does that mean? Um, you know, what segment are we specific to? What, um, what, what focus are we taking? the better the choice will be. Two is I would say um, some choices are not real. Um, so I'll give you an example. If, you're, if, you're, if we're working with a company that's going to, or wants to go into say China, explore the Chinese market, um, and it has a choice about exploring the Chinese market versus you know, taking on a new customer segment here in Australia. And we look at those two choices and we play them out. Um, well, you know, if it came down to it and you said, well, look, it's gonna cost you this much to sort of enter the Chinese market. Um, if it costs too much and you don't have that money, well, it's not really a choice. So let's not even explore that um, as an option. Um, and you might look at a different choice. So those are a couple of little tricks that we do see when, when formulating strategy uh, that, that give people a different way of, you know, not having to do the analysis paralysis, but get them to a point where they can understand, you know, is this choice real or not? If, if I can interrupt you for a second. Yeah. I'm across that cascade of kind of choices. I'm just imagining like a decision tree in my head. How do you make sure that you've covered all possible scenarios? Yeah, that's a really good one. So all possible scenarios are, 
that's a tricky one because I think you've got lots of scenarios that are playing out in the future. What you have to look at are the options that are available to you, given the scenarios that you think are playing out in the future. And you know, one of the topics I think we, we, we were going to talk about or are going to talk about is about scenarios. And um, this concept of in strategy, um, you can't really analyze yourself to, to the future. You actually have to paint a picture of what that future might be. And often the, way, the best way to do that is to look at some critical uncertainties that are, that are playing out for you and then say to a company, well, um, given these uncertainties are playing, that are playing out in, you know, what are the different ways or what are your different options given those uncertainties? And to create a really good and resilient strategy, um, you have to think about, well, what are the options that a must do in those, in those scenarios versus wh which ones are optional? And given the scenarios that are playing out, um, which ones would we take on if that scenario played out versus that scenario playing out? Um, a bit hard to describe. I wish I had a whiteboard with me um, drawing this up. But the, the point there is that um, actually you have to bake future thinking, scenario thinking into your choice making in order to understand how, how resilient a choice is. Now, also to your question, I think is, um, I think traditional strategy, you know, you think about Ansoft matrix, um, two by twos and, you know, new customers, new, new, new products and, and look at it like that. Actually, I think the, the influence of design thinking in the way that we think through strategic options for clients has become more prevalent probably in the last five years than, than ever before, because it really, uh, it, that approach asks you to go quite divergent in the kinds of options that, that a client might have or a company might have and bring it back into, well, what is possible? And we use this framing in, in that process called, which, which basically asks the questions, what would you need to be, what would need to be true? Um, and so you can ask back to a, 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 a client across the dimensions um, of say customer, channel, competitor set, um, financial resilience, cost base, you know, what would need to be true for this option to work into the future or given the scenarios that are playing out. And most of the time, um, you know, clients or, or companies will have an answer for, for many of those things, but there may be one or two that they don't. They, they say, you know what, I have no idea, um, you know, how our competitors will react if we go into this choice. You know, can you help us think through, um, you know, maybe even war game, um, you know, what would be the competitor interactions that might happen if we start going after this market with this product. So that gives people um, confidence that the choice that they are making, or the choices that they are making are the right ones to make, um, which ultimately is kind of my job, um, is, to, is to help organizations gain confidence about the future, about the choices that they'll make. I think there was a second part to your question. I can't remember what it was now. No, no, you, no, you covered it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Another question I want to bolt on, and this is sort of going to flip it on its head a bit. So we've considered strategy in a more abstract way and in about what are the ideas that are within strategy. Just looking at on the sort of really practical individual level, what is it that makes an individual really good at strategies? So what are the certain qualities that enables them to be a good strategist? Maybe if you can think of maybe the best consultants you've come across in the, in the last yeah. few years. Yeah, look, I, I think there's, there's a couple of things. I think, um, you know, firstly, the first thing that you learn probably in the first two to three years of being a consultant is about structured problem solving. And the quality, it's, it's a quality, but it's also just a frame that you have to get very familiar with because what we're dealing with is very complex problems. They are abstract, as you said. Um, and the only way, the really, really the best way to solve it um, is not trying to solve it at the highest system level. It's to break down the system and solve the component parts. So like I just talked you through there where we say, well, you know, what would need to be true for this strategy to be real? Actually you can break it down into the component parts where you have high confidence of the answer or you have medium to low confidence. In, able to do it, in order to do that, you need to have some way of um, framing and structuring problems. Uh, and so there's, there's a bunch of frameworks out there. There's, there's a book by Barbara Minto called The Pyramid Principle, if you, if you want to, if your listeners want to read that. That gives a really good guide as to <clears throat> how to take a problem, very complex one, and turn it into bite-sized chunks. So that is probably point number one. Point number two, and I think this is, I kind of alluded this as, to this as well, but I think this kind of concept of design and taking a, 
a concept, exploring the optionality, and then bringing it back into a, a converged set of options is also another skill set that I think is really important. Being comfortable to say, you know what, we don't have to have the answer right now because we're actually exploring different different options um, and having a process by which you do that is, is a skill set that I think is really um, valuable. Fourthly, I would say, you know, analytically, um, you need to understand how, how choices actually affect the real business. So, um, and when I say real business, the P&L, um, you know, what is the bottom line impact of something? So uh, you know, me personally, I, I went into my CA uh, after leaving, leaving uh, um, university and studied that at Deloitte um, because I wanted to make sure that I had a very good grounding in, um, you know, down to the debits and credits level of, you know, when you make a choice, um, how does that impact a profit and loss statement? Then I think finally, there's probably the more intangible ones, but you know, curiosity is super important. The, the ability to ask the next question, well, why? Why do you want to do that? Why, why are you going to make that choice? Um, why, you know, ask three steps ahead. What would happen here and here and here? Um, and I think the other one would be the ability to, to be open to new styles of thinking and new, new concepts, uh, particularly when you are looking at strategies which are you know, affecting the sort of five to 10 year life cycle. Um, you know, and, and certainly in telco where you've got very big infrastructure investments um, that are long term, you need to think about the, the long term uh, opportunities that exist and be quite open to what are the potential um, changes that are happening in the market. So, you know, those are probably some of the things that I've seen. That's really powerful. I think something I found really powerful there, and you mentioned to me um, the same point when we were getting coffee, was that you actually had a client um, you're doing a job with. And you didn't really, I think, know the answer or know much to do about it. And what you really just framed it as was an opportunity to listen and learn and sort of sit down with someone, understand what they're going through. And then through that process, seeing how can you apply your own knowledge and frameworks? And I think that's something that is a bit contrarian because I think when we imagine strategy leaders, we think, oh, you're going to have an answer straight away. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just about honestly saying, I don't know and listening. Yeah. It's like that Einstein approach of sharpening the ax before you cut down the tree. Um, <laughs> Peter. Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned kind of you've alluded to throughout how um, you think it's more and more important to build futuristic thinking into strategy and um, you've also kind of alluded to some of these mega trends that I think me and Adam have spent a lot of time thinking about and are coming 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 across our world um, how do you think how do you see them playing out in the telco media and tech industry yeah look I, I love this industry uh, for, for lots of different reasons but um, it is there's such a convergence of all these mega trends uh, playing out in, in this industry specifically, uh, and you know, at a at a rate of change that, that I think is greater than others. Um, you know, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether that's um, advanced wireless networks, 5G, Wi-Fi 6, um, cloud, um, all those trends have sort of passed into into these industries. And whether you're a media company, a broadcast media company, a journalistic company, you know. Even just the recent, uh, what's recently happened in, uh, um, you know, Facebook sort of turning off media sites. There's so many interesting things that are playing out um, across uh, that industry as a whole. So I think, you know, that's that's a really interesting example. COVID-19 is a really interesting example of, of looking at what is, what is the effect of, uh, the, you know, that pandemic on an industry which, you know, has seen a lot of um, pressure for for price drop. And I'm talking specifically about, um, you know, telcos here, um, where margins have been squeezed consistently over the course of the last 10 years. Um, as, you know, data has become cheaper, um, you know, customer experience has been optimised. Um, so something like the pandemic has actually called into question uh, a lot of what uh, telcos can consider, you know, places for advantage, but also, spawned a lot of new opportunities for them. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the bits of research I did sort of halfway through the pandemic, um, start of the pandemic last year was um, looking at what are the potential scenarios for, for telcos uh, as a result of the pandemic and how that might play out over the next two to three years. And and one of the, one of the sort of key findings there with the that was that there were these sort of two two dimensions, which it's not complicated. It's sort of the telco's ability to monetize 
the critical inf infrastructure, so fiber in the ground or mobile networks, and the rate at which customers are moving towards more digital interactions with, with um, all types of organizations, not just telcos. So, you know, the rate at which uh, telehealth is playing out, the rate at which, uh, you know, education online is playing out, and how quickly is that happening? Because those two critical uncertainties um, actually provide different opportunity sets for, for, for telcos to look at. Yeah, and with the economic uncertainty as well. So, um, you know, uh, I'm just talking to our economists at Deloitte. They basically said the best indicator for um, the the economy is actually the health statistics. So, you know, how many people have COVID? How many people are getting them, getting it? And so we've done relatively well on a global scale in terms of that metric. But, you know, that sort of created different, different uh, economic uh, environments. So, you know, coming back to those two by twos, um, there's definitely a, a case in which telcos can seize the opportunity that's presented by a greater set of digital or digital interactions that are occurring and monetize it. So um, with new offerings, so whether that's you know, virtual health offerings or um, uh, you know, virtual education offerings or, or, or others um, and look at ways to charge for that. The, the opposite of that would be that they don't do that. And actually the economic situation is so dire that people won't pay extra for, for any of those services. And therefore it's still a commodity game. And that's actually happening quicker than it was previously. So you know, this, is, this is sort of a way of teasing out, well, what are the different option sets that you might have as an organization to give you flexibility in your strategy to you know, take on you know, more advanced uh, uh, offerings uh, as it relates to customer digitization or indeed Bunker down, cut costs, and make sure you can meet a, a lower cost to serve, a lower cost to cost to provide your services. So yeah, it's buying out very quickly. Um, as I said uh, at the start, I mean this is this is sort of an industry in which um, whether you look at it or not, it's a bit of a, a bellwether for um, new technologies coming along. Um, 5G is uh, you know on the cusp of being delivered in its standalone form here in Australia, which I think is really interesting. But I think there's a huge challenge for, for a lot of telcos in the way that they look to monetize the infrastructure there. And with that, I think we'll bring new opportunities for other players to, to, to play in the connect connectivity ecosystem, whether that's some of the tower players, whether that's some of you know, the, the hyperscalers, um, or even, even some less traditional players uh, in the area, which I think is, is fascinating for, um, for the industry as a whole. Yeah, there's a lot of trends playing out right now, especially in Toko. It must be a fascinating time for you. And just focusing specifically on technology, are there any innovations or technology that you're right now really fascinated about? And if so, what do you think might be the impact of this? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I, I am. There's a few, actually. Uh, look, I, I love the crossover between data and um, entertainment. And I think it's, it's such an interesting time that we, we're in. And you know, we recently re launched uh, our TMT predictions for 2021. It's a report that we've been doing here at Deloitte for the last 20 years. And um, we look, look a year ahead into some of these bigger trends. So those trends are playing out over the course of five to 10 years, but we try and say, look, what's going to happen in the next year as it relates to that trend? Um, the one around sort of, we have a prediction this year around the hyper-quantified athlete and its effect on monetizing a long list of sports that currently aren't monetizable. And, and what I mean by that is sort of tier two sports in Australia. Um, you know, if you, if you go and look at um, sort of shoot shield rugby or um, even lower than that, sort of lower grade rugby um, with data um, allows you to provide streaming, um, which allows you to provide a, a watchable or quantifiable or, um, you know, if, if you take it to an extreme, a, an opportunity to wager on some of those, those sports where it never happened before. Um, I think there are a whole bunch of other applications that come when you are you know, gathering the data that sits around each game, each player, each move, each, each um, uh, play um, that, that occurs within, within a game. And um, we're only starting to see the tip of the iceberg on that. Um, I think the other one for me would be... Um, and I'm also also a sport one um, is uh, the monetization of women's sport 
and I, and I think Australia is such a leader in this space. Um, we've got amazing female um, sports talent, um, which to this day, that, that, that industry globally is not even a billion dollar industry. Um, whereas sport as a whole is multi-billion dollars, like $400 billion, and it's mostly male driven. Uh, I just think we have a major opportunity um, with the technologies that we do have and uh, the emphasis that we can put on um, female talent uh, to, to create a much better uh, equal playing field for, for women's sport. Um, you know, I don't know if you watched the, the final of the women's tennis on the weekend, but it was, um, it was fantastic. And it only gets better. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of, of women's sport as well. Yeah. And on that point of data and entertainment, the thing that first comes to my mind is Netflix. So obviously this company, which has totally upended the traditional um, media and entertainment landscape um, by providing personalized recommend recommendations and almost unlimited choice. Where do you see the future of streaming going? Um, are there any sort of big changes? And do you think that the situation we have now, is this just here to stay? Or do you think there's more innovations to come? When we look at streaming. And just as, as an add on to that, I'd love to hear about how you kind of like, obviously streaming is this trend that's kind of been shaping out how we've grown up, but how does also that subs the subscription trend relate to that as well? Because um, me and Adam sometimes think that how many subscriptions can one person <laughs> have? Yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, look, this is, this is probably a whole topic on its own, but yeah. um, look, we do our media consumer survey here in Australia every year. Um, and from that, you can see that uh, I think it's 90% of Australians now have a streaming, a streaming video on demand subscription. Um, and it's up to sort of 20, I think it's 20, 25% of Australians have at least five. So it's, it's, it's growing. Uh, if you looked across all digital subscriptions, um, the data for that looks like on average, people have up to 10, uh, 10 to 12 digital subscriptions that includes news, music, video, um, et cetera. So yeah, it's certainly a proliferation of streaming. Um, and look, I think, I think I, I won't necessarily put myself out there and say what, the, what I think the future is, but there's, there's a couple of different ways it can go. I, I certainly think this has been the, the unbundling of the pay TV bundle. Um, and that's been occurring for over the course of the last 10 years with all these new streaming services coming for Netflix as, as a core example of that. Um, I think there's a, probably a position for an aggregator to, to bring it all back together because the searching of content's tricky. Um, you know, if you want to watch a particular show, it's very difficult to actually go and find that. You, you have to go and search online. Probably most people are using Google or Finder to actually work out which service has which show. Um, so there's something around the re-aggregation of it um, that I think is coming. The other side to this is the business model. And... Um, whilst it's streaming, it's, it's subscription video on demand, so you're paying for it. Um, there's really great examples of ad supported models that do exist around the world. Um, and particularly in, in Asia, there's, there's some amazing uh, advertising video on demand models. And there's a sort of balance between, you know, what, what will people pay for and what do they want to pay for versus are they happy to just have advertising and, and watch the content, which feels a little bit like free, to, free TV or free to air TV as it was previously. So look, I think it's in an interesting stage. Uh, there's a lot of exclusivity contents driving that as well. So huge content budgets that are being put into it. The other side to it is that you've got Apple, Amazon, whose core business model is not to make money out of content. They might make money out of selling devices or selling books or you know, e-commerce. So um, their intent around streaming is kind of decoupled from the business model that, that does exist. So um, you know, their, their intentions are probably quite different to someone like a Netflix who is really about the content or someone, some of the local streaming players that we do have. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how those different players who have different business models that relate to content actually um, you know, change the way that they or evolve as competition increases as the industry also changes. Yeah, I think I'm going to move us on because otherwise we'll ask you a hundred other questions and, <laughs> and stuff. So Peter, you've mentioned that you have a passion for youth empowerment and you've done some work with Be Inspiring, a not-for-profit that works in that opportunities for high school students area. And yeah. you've also um, written an article that we at both love, which is 25 for 25 and um, your 25 kind of best bits of advice for people around that early 20s age which is really good for us because something we always ask on the podcast is what's one piece of advice you'd leave 
your, the audience with, and this is 25 pieces of advice. So I'd love if you can kind of um, give the audience a summary of kind of those learnings and maybe something that you would tell every person in their early 20s about what they should look for in their career or when starting up their career. Yeah, and look, it, it does come back to that story I told you um, about my friends. Um, and, you know, youth empowerment, I think, is so important because, um, you know, particularly particularly right now where the youth unemployment rate is so high, it's higher than it had been, uh, you know, in the GFC, which is about 2008, when I started um, uh, in, in a corporate career. Um, so, you know, the other the other thing that I've become more aware of is that there are a lot of 20 year olds or people in their 20s um, who reach out for advice. So um, I did want to try and distill some of the, the learnings that I had. Um, I think the I think the key thesis, and I, I did talk about this in the article, was just um, you know not to waste your 20s. Um, and there's a great TED talk if you want to re- look at it. There's a book if you want to read it by a lady called Meg Dr. Meg J, who who basically says, look, don't waste your don't waste your 20s. Uh, you know, 30 is not the new 20. Um, and she boils it down to these three concepts of, you know, do something that is an investment in what you might be next. So create some identity capital. Um, two, it's about expand your network beyond your friends. Uh, like friendships, jobs, future partners often arise from beyond your closest circles. And then three, you know, start picking your family now. So you, you may not settle down in your 20s, but um, you know, it's a good time to work on your marriage before you are married. So uh, you know, all those things resonated with me. You know, I was lucky enough to have you know some great mentors over um, you know over the time that I've had uh, you know to date, and uh, you know give me their advice um, mainly because I sorted out um, more than not. And uh, you know, to me, that twenty-five for twenty-five is sort of a d- distilling what are the best pieces of advice I had in my twenties. Um, which you know, for me, probably number one is about being really clear on what is important to you, which is can seem hard if you're 22 years old and you you know the world's your oyster um but actually sitting down and taking time to think about that um is really important because it does start to drive where you do where you play um and what are your aspirations into the future um i think the other the other one is there's some great things around just creating habits um you know i i think if i finished university and never played sport again um you know, I would be a completely different person, but, you know, I've made sure that fitness is a big part of my life um, and, and tried to, to, to use that to not only extend, um, you know, the time that I'm here on, on earth, but also to, to you know, get more out of what I'm doing on, on a daily basis. So, yeah, youth empowerment, I think, is, is really important for, for lots of reasons. I think, you know, there are a lot of pieces, people out there who haven't had the chances that I've had. Um, and, uh, if, if I can work with organizations like Be Inspiring um, or the Australian India Youth Dialogue, which I, I took part in in 2018, to um, think of new ways or different ways in which to help youth um, in Australia and in India as well um, as, with that sort of partnership, um, help, help them understand what are the opportunities that are in front of them um, or give them the ability to, to grasp those opportunities, get, a gain, get gainful employment, and I'm more than happy to, to be involved. So it's been, been become a bigger part of my life uh, in the last five to 10 years. That's some fantastic advice. And one of the challenges that you mentioned in the article was about youth unemployment. Um, I think the statistic was something like 16%, was it? Yeah. For people over the I age of 20. That was the height of COVID. At the height of COVID, over yeah. the age of 20, just finish a university degree. So even if we sort of follow all these great pieces of advice, there are going to be a lot of people that are sort of spaced out um, of the job market. And what would you maybe say to university students graduating generally about advice on how to get that sort of first start in the industry? I, I think just try. Like I, I hustled like anything to get my first jobs. Um, and, you know, it, it required, you know, one of the very first jobs I had was working at Macquarie Bank. Um, and I, a friend of mine actually hustled so hard there. He, he ended up, you know, getting a newspaper job. And then he and I and another friend of mine ended up doing a 4 a.m. shift um, on the equities desk to to provide news reports back in. And I did that solidly for, for a year and a half, um, you know, with the intention of, you know, getting to learn as much as possible. Um, I think 
you know, it doesn't matter what the vocation is that you have, um, you know, your ability to put yourself out there, do the work, do, even if you're not going to get a reward, but do the work because you can experience something is part of that point. Number one, that I think Dr. Meg Jay makes around identity capital. Um, you can start to form, what is your identity? What do you want to be? What are you, are you someone who likes waking up at 4am to do news reports or not? Um, can be a big part of just even taking that first step. So, you know, just start, I think is, 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 is the biggest point I would say. Yeah, I, I think that's so important because I think a lot of people going into university have this attitude that after uni, they'll just find a sort of nice job. They've got the degree, they did well in high school. The reality is, and what we've seen is that you've got to work so hard just yeah. to get a job. This means coffees, lots of preparing for interviews, so many applications. We've known people that have done over 70 applications mm. and ended up getting one or two offers. And that Very is well. the reality today, especially yeah. if you're a commerce student and you're applying to competitive industries. There's a lot of people trying to squeeze into one door. Yeah. yeah. And something I quickly want to dive into is you mentioned this part about being more deliberate in your 20s about what you want to do. And I think the first point I completely agree with. But the second and third point, we've actually had a lot of guests who have said that in your 20s is a time to experience before that period in which you settle down and have these kind of diverse experiences that can give you a more informed view of who you are. So in terms of building that identity capital and having diverse experiences, how do you think that plays out into that narrative about like, you know, having a more kind of strategic view of your twenties? Yeah. I mean, it's a good point. I, I don't think those two ideas are in conflict. Um, to be honest, I think you can explore a lot of things, but also make some pretty solid bets um, in, in your career and your identity capital during this time. And, you know, I've, I've got countless examples of, of people who have done that, but, I think the opposite is is scary where you you get to your 30s and you haven't done that um i think that that can put out people quite a lot or set them back quite a lot where they feel like they haven't made the sort of investment in in what they want to be or the skill sets that they, that they want to have and and certainly um, meg jay in that book makes that point where you know if you get to 30 and you haven't really done that much in terms of you know getting your feet on the ground on what it, what you want to be a core vocation a core set of skills it can be very hard and can lead to a lot of um, challenges in your 30s and later on so i think you can explore a lot of things you can you know, i certainly did this i mean even even um you know doing things like the two tribes podcast um at a, at a point in time uh, where you know i was already a partner at deloitte um was still about exploring other things um that were going on uh, meeting new people as you guys do in, in your podcast so you can continually do that it may not be the core vocation that you have but um your ability to get that core set of skills um that creates an identity that you can you can bank on and make money on uh, in the future is a really really important thing to do now there are always people who are exceptions to that rule so um it's not, not a hard and fast thing, but I do think more often than not having that sort of set of clearly bankable skill sets that you're building up in your twenties is a really important thing to do. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I think before we go into the quick fire questions, there's a question that I want to ask surrounding, I think we probably should have asked it earlier is what is your motivation with consulting? What draws you to being a consultant? Because it seems like you have a wide breadth of interests and a lot of things you could have possibly pursued. Um, what's it that has kept you here for all these years? Yeah, I mean, good question. I ask myself that a lot. Um, but, you know, one of the core things about consulting is, um, you know, I, I like helping people. I, I like giving people the advice that helps them either pursue a fruitful career themselves or take a company in a direction with confidence that, um, you know, they may not have had otherwise. Um, at the end of the day, that is the thing that, that really does drive me. Um, I also, in a company like Deloitte, which has, you know, over 300,000 people globally, it's in 150 plus locations. Um, I also love working with a firm which has that size and scale. And so the problems that I get to work on um, are not the same as the problems if I was just doing it myself. Um, so, you know, some of the work that I've done has, you know, has affected the whole of Australia uh, in some way, shape or form, which I couldn't say if I was perhaps in just one job or just an entrepreneur in a very niche field. And that to me is, uh, continues to be one of the things that does inspire me and keeps me going in the work that I do. Um, I also get to work with some amazing people. So um, whether they're, they're people fresh out of uh, university, 
um, or whether they're the most eminent person in their field um, with you know, a doctorate in economics or, or you know, a PhD in, in uh, computer science. Like there's lots of different types of people that I, I get to work with, which um, one of my things that I love is just you know, having the diversity of skill sets that sits around me. Um, and that's another reason to continue doing the work that I do. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Another awesome answer. Now, we don't have that long left, so we're going to go into our quick fire round of questions. So, Peter, what we're going to do is that we're going to ask you four questions back to back um, and give you 30 seconds each. You ready? Yep. Awesome. Question number one, what's one of your favorite books and why? Yeah, uh, probably favorite book at the moment is uh, Give and Take by Adam Grant. And why? I think it's gives a really good account of what are the different types of personalities that you find in a corporate world and puts a different slant on how to succeed in, in corporate business. Awesome. Question number two, what's one of your favorite podcasts and why? Oh, I have so many. Um, look, I'm a big fan of the Bill, Bill Simmons podcast, uh, The Ringer. Um, I love basketball, so I, I like to listen to that. Um, probably one of the ones that I come to a lot is uh, one by Barry Ritholtz um, on Bloomberg, which is called Masters in Business. Um, he yeah, one a lot. Yeah, he uh, interviews some of the most interesting people. I love his interview style, and there's always something I learned from that podcast. Yeah. Who's a figure that you found inspirational, but you've never met? Uh, Martin Luther King. So uh, he's always been an inspiration for me. Um, and having two, two uh, children now, um, just recently reading about him because it was Martin Luther King Day the other day, um, I'm continually inspired by his passion, his perseverance, um, his ideology, and what he stood up to, um, to make a change in the world that really, really mattered. Awesome. Last question, outside of work, what's one of your favorite hobbies? Well, I've got a few. So I love running. Um, that would probably be hobby number one. But um, I recently bought a surf ski. Well, not that recently, about um, 12 months ago. So uh, yeah, I love taking the surf ski out onto the harbour down Lancaster River. Um, uh, it's just helped me to see a whole other side of Sydney uh, that you, know, you don't get to see from the road. So um, yeah, hugely, hugely passionate about that. That's sick. Very good answers. And we like to just finish off our podcast by um, asking our guests if there's one piece of advice through your kind of diverse career that you could leave our audience with, um, what do you think that would be? You can't say well, be nice. Uh, well, I said at the start, work hard and be nice um, would, be, would be my main thing that I would leave people with. It's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, but yeah, look, I think outside of that, um, always be curious. Always be curious with, um, what you do always ask the next why question even when it doesn't feel natural to me that's ended up in some really really interesting conversations it's helped me crack really really difficult problems and it has never failed me yet so always ask that next why awesome fantastic advice you like being sharp. this is a great episode for a lot of people that are <laughs> graduate job you guys wanting advice in life all right thank you awesome Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for setting it up.